So I'm standing in my new project studio space and one of the last things I need to do to get it fully up and running is add some acoustic treatment. I'm gonna cut to the audio on the camera real quick versus the mic because you'll be able to quickly hear how untreated this room is and how basically how many echoes, how many reflections there are on my voice. Reflections cause other acoustic issues. So if you can acoustically treat specific reflections, you mitigate and reduce those other issues. Now, if you're in a bedroom or you're renting or you think there's just no way you can possibly acoustically treat your space, I'd be willing to bet you can. A little bit of acoustic treatment goes a long way. You don't have to go crazy with it. So that being said, let's dive right into it because this is gonna be a doozy. So the first step in acoustically treating your space is actually making sure that your listening position where you've set up your desk and your monitors is in the best possible spot that it can be. Now I know you don't have a lot of flexibility, especially if your project studio is in a bedroom or in a house that you share, or in a room in a house that you share with someone else, or if it's in a small room like in an apartment. Look, I have been there. I have probably acoustically treated now eight or nine studios in the past seven years. I move way too much. And yeah, you just have to make do with what you have, right? So let's use my room as an example. This is a pretty big room. And I actually realistically only had one position I could put my desk in. So if we look over to my left, we'll see that I could have stuck it on that back wall in theory. Only problem is there's a window and that wall that meets the corner of the closet you see is, a, is definitely a corner, so there's gonna be some base build up there, but it's too small to put a base trap. And I also thought that having sliding doors on the right hand side of me and another door on the left would just be too many doors to deal with, so that side of the room is out. Now if we move over to the right hand side of the room, Similar problems, but a little bit better, but a massive window, which is cool for natural light, right? I'll take it, but I don't wanna deal with treating that big of a window, so that, that one's out. Now, what about the wall behind me? Well, it could work, or it would work, except in this corner here to, behind me to my right, there is part of a room that butts up against that corner, or shares that corner, I guess, and it's a laundry room. So I decided I wanted to be as far away as possible from that noise source, so that left me with that wall. So that's the best spot for it. Well, what are some other tips and tricks you can do to maximize your listening position? Well, try not to have it butt up right against the wall. So a lot of people do that. They stick the desk right against the wall and then their monitors are like that far away from the wall. The problem with that is that most monitors expel air out the back. And when they expel air out the back and it's this far away from a wall, it's gonna be nearly impossible to st even A, fit acoustic treatment behind it, and B, stop that sound from reflecting back towards you. So if you have the space, try to pull your desk out from the wall a little bit like you see here. So basically what we're gonna be doing in this step is we're gonna be using some free software called Room Equalization Wizard, which allows you to get a understanding of what's going on in your room acoustically and sonically. We're basically gonna pass a frequency sweep through this specialized microphone, and then we're gonna use that with the software so I know what frequencies are building up where, so I have a kind of a plan of attack, so I'm not just shooting in the dark, hanging stuff up on walls, making holes without any rhyme or reason. All right, so here's the free software I, talk, I spoke about earlier, Room EQ Wizard. Now the first thing you're gonna do when you open this is go up to the top right-hand corner, hit the preferences wrench icon, and you'll be in the preferences panel. We need to do two things before we actually run the test. We need to calibrate our sound card, our audio interface, and our microphone. The reason you have to do this, or you should do this, in theory, any hardware in the signal chain or signal path could impart noise and could alter the results of the test, making them less than accurate. So basically what we're gonna be doing with the audio interface is we're gonna be sending a signal from the output right back into the input, and then Room EQ Wizard's gonna do its uh, wizardry, and it's going to know what, if any, noise is being imparted on the signal. So Room EQ Wizard is going to basically, depending on how, how loud you set it, but I have it set to negative 12 dBFS. It's gonna give you an output signal, which I've muted here. It's just a high-pitched sine wave. And then once you have it set up and you start to do the calibration, you need to match the input signal by actually physically turning up the gain on your, on your audio interface or your sound card. Once they're matched about the same, you are then going to hit calibrate. Now, once it does this thing, you'll see this little chart here and you're good to go. It should look something like this, pretty flat, right? Then you're going to uh, save this file so you can pull it up if you want to run other tests at other times. Definitely save it. So now we're going to calibrate the microphone, and by calibrate the microphone, I mean we're going to load in a file that will tell Room EQ Wizard how the microphone should be calibrated. So it's a little bit easier if you're using a calibration mic because those will come with what's called .cal files. I'm using the Sonarworks calibration microphone, and I have these three files that came with it or that I downloaded from the uh, online resources when I logged into the account. And you'll see that there's a 30 degree and 90 degree. I'm gonna choose and load in the 90 degree because that's how I'm orienting my mic in the actual test. We have one more thing we need to do before we can run the test. 
We're gonna click up here where you see the SPL meter and we're gonna pull that up. We're gonna choose speaker cal for this because I'm using monitors, speakers, not a sub. What we need to do is we need to make sure that when the audio leaves the monitors and hits my microphone, it is the same volume that Room EQ Wizard thinks it should be. So I'm gonna set this to 80 dB. We now need 80 dB of signal hitting my microphone, right? So you can think if your microphone's two feet back, three feet back, you need to have this quite loud. So now it's kind of a song and dance between the output of my, my audio interface and the gain of the input of the microphone. I want them to match, and I'm gonna use an SPL meter on my iPhone to get them to be as close to 80 dB as possible. So we can see here that it's really close. It's teetering between 79, like 81. That should do. So now we finally get to go up here to the top left hand corner and hit measure and we can take our first measurement. So we're gonna have it set to type SPL for the name and you know, obviously whatever you want. I'm gonna put in some notes here for the listing position, uh, which speaker I have this coming out of. And then we're going to go over to uh, down here to the right where it says range. Now I want the range to be 15 Hertz to 20,000 Hertz. You could change that if you wanted base this off of your monitors and what they can reproduce. Now we're going to leave it at negative uh, 12 dB full scale. Now over on the right, choose at least 512 for your length. I read online that the higher you go for this, the more accurate it gets. Now repetitions, I'm gonna do two. Again, more the more repetitions you get, the more room EQ wizard can balance things out. Now down here where it says delay, choose something higher than like one or two, five to 10. This will give you basically from when you hit start, it'll give you, a t I have it set to a 10 second delay so I can leave the room, vacate the premises so I don't have to hear 80 dB of a sign sweep coming at me. So we're ready to go. I'm gonna hit start and I'm gonna bounce. All right, so after you run your test, you should see this type of squiggly audio on your screen and it should pop you out to the all SPL or SPL phase view. Now we're gonna just jump right into the deep end and go to the uh, waterfall view. Now, real quick before I get into it uh, too much, let's set, if you guys are following along, I want you to be able to basically copy these controls. Go to the control tab and copy these in 50, 500, 450, 100, and apply a smoothing of one over 12. Go to your limits and set that to 100, 25, 36, and 500. Now, the left hertz I have set to 25 because my monitors don't go lower than about 33. So if you have a sub, you might wanna go lower than 25. And the frequencies capped at 500 hertz because uh, the high frequencies are just not gonna be hard to deal with. I, I'm much more concerned with everything from the, you know. 25, 30, 40, 50 range up to 500 Hertz. So that's why I just set this way. And to get it to be this straight on view, go to the perspective settings and copy these 50, zero, 89, or you can do 90, I just couldn't get it 90 and 150. And then you'll have this straight on view. So what this is telling us, what this is showing us is it is showing us how long it's taking certain frequencies to decay and basically how long they stay high energy for. So this heat index over here going from red to purple shows us the amount of energy down here on the bottom, we have our frequency, and over here on the left, we have the SPL, and the corners wall of the room up at the top left and right, that's showing us our time window, which is the first thing we looked at in the controls tab. So what we wanna see when we're done with this, when we're done acoustically treating, we wanna see more of a quick fade down from the yellow to the green to the blue to the purple, and hopefully we see a little bit of purple as we uh, extend down to the floor and hopefully we see a lot more of the floor. If you think about this as a three dimensional space and you think about these waveforms that kind of like smushed up against a glass wall as, as they reach your computer screen, uh, that means that those frequencies still have a lot of energy by the time the window is closing for this view. And they're hopefully going to be much reduced when we, uh, much reduced. Hopefully we're going to reduce that by quite a bit when we get the acoustic treatment up. Now let's jump over to the all SPL or SPL phase view. So another thing that people who use REW like to do is they like to look at the variance between the peak and kind of the valley at a given frequency at an SPL. And they, they kind of want to see where they're at. So basically once your room's treated, you would hope that you're at about plus or minus three. Uh, we're well well over that at many points in low frequencies. The high frequencies, I'm not that worried about. All these weird dips and spikes should go away once we start to get some treatment up and that should actually have a drastic reduction or at least I would hope that we'd see a drastic reduction in that. All right, so now we can finally talk about the different types of acoustic treatment options. Now the first thing might shock you, it's probably things you already have. There are actually some just basic home items that pretty much everyone has access to that will actually help you in your quest to acoustically treat your project studio. So the first thing, look at your windows. Do you have drapes or blinds? If you don't, try to get those 
doesn't cover those because windows are reflective, obviously. Next thing, if you're in, a, if you're in an environment like I'm in right now where you have reflective floors, I have vinyl plank flooring, or if you have wood floor, tile, you're gonna wanna lay down an area rug. If you have carpet, you're good. Carpet actually has some high frequency attenuation. Now, what about like things like couches, chairs, sofas, uh, beds even, right? Those things will absorb frequencies. So I'm gonna bring in a couch, a little sofa, and put it on this back wall. All right, so moving on to the actual acoustic specific acoustic treatment options. The first thing I wanna talk about is something called bass traps. If you have a lot of bass buildup and you're trying to mix on monitors, it's going to give you a false representation of the low end of your mix and you're either gonna get really thin hollow mixes or you're gonna get mixes that people say are muddy. So bass traps are usually pretty thick, six to eight inches, and they go typically in the corner of your room. They don't have to go in the corners, but that's probably the best place to start because that's where bass frequencies like to hang out and build up. So I have a few different types of bass traps. Here's one that I made myself, and I made this using just some wood for, uh, some wood from Home Depot or Lowe's. I basically drilled it together, and then I stuck in some uh, rock wool safe and sound and put fabric on top. And that's actually what professionally made bass panels or bass absorbers will use. They'll use some type of insulation. Sometimes it is rock wool safe and sound but they're just put together better than mine. But I've had mine for about five or six years now and it's going strong. So here's another one that I bought from GIK Acoustics. And then here's one that I've never used before. This is called a corner trap base trap. It basically fits a corner of a room. And this is nice if you are kind of crunched on space. Now let's move on to broadband absorption panels. Again, just like the base traps made in a very similar way, these have an insulation in it. Usually it's rockable safe and sound, sometimes denim, even owns corning rigid fiberglass. And again, they're covered with fabric in a wood frame. Another type of uh, absorption, you've probably seen this many times, is uh, studio foam. And a lot of people don't like studio foam. I like how it looks, so I'm gonna put it up. It really only captures, attenuates high frequency content. So there's really no point in using a lot of this. And the last thing we're gonna look at is diffusion or diffusers. So if you've ever seen these kind of cool geometric shaped things that people say are great for studios, they're diffusers. Basically, they scatter waveforms and make them lose their energy. Now, I'm not using any of those specifically, but I do have some new panels that are a mix between diffusion and broadband absorption. And these are made by GIK Acoustics. So we're finally to the part of the video where I'll be actually putting up my acoustic treatment. Now way back in the intro, I alluded to that there's kind of an order of operations you can follow when you're acoustically treating your space. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get the corner base traps up. I'm gonna to go to the corner directly behind me in my listing position and install those. Those are those new corner base traps where I can just stack them. On the other walls, I'm gonna just have to use base traps with some fish hooks, which I'll install with some picture hanging wire attached to the fish hooks, both on the panel and the wall. So unfortunately, I have a door in one of my uh, on one of my early reflection points, which means I have to get something up on it, but acoustically treating doors can be tough. Um, obviously you gotta open and close the door. So whatever you hang on the door has to be securely fastened. So I'm gonna be using some drywall anchors and a lot of the picture hanging wire to make sure this panel's not gonna fall off every time I open and close the door. Now the wall, in directly in front of my listening position, I want that to look good because I have to stare at it. So I'm actually gonna kind of mock it up and map it out in a graphics editing software like Photoshop. This specific one you see here is called Affinity Designer. And it's just gonna help me uh, reduce the amount of holes I have to drill and just get an idea of where I can hang certain panels. panels because I need one, I need the broadband absorption panel right behind my right monitor. My left monitor is pointing at a corner, so it's gonna hit the corner base trap, so that's good. And then I'm also gonna have a couple gaps. I'm gonna have to order a couple more panels. You see the gaps on the wall. So now we're looking at the wall directly behind me in my listening position. I, I need a couple more panels to truly finish this, but this is a good start. I have obviously the base traps left and right, and then I have a horizontal base trap right above the couch that you see. And then there's a broadband absorb absorbing panel with the diffusion on it in the middle. That's the white one. And then to the left and right of that, I have just some broadband absorption panels kind of spaced out. All right, so I ran my final test with Room EQ Wizard with the acoustic treatment on the wall. Right now, there's 36 different panels on the wall. I'm not counting the little bits of acoustic foam here and there. And I don't have nearly enough for this space. I need probably about four to six more base traps and probably four more broadband absorptions, absorption panels. So let's dive into what Room EQ Wizard is telling us and seeing how good of a job I did with the acoustic treatment. So the nice thing about Room EQ Wizard is you can actually show different tests at the same time and plot them over themselves. So this orange, the orange line here is the first test we did. And the green teal one is the new one. And you can see that there's less variance overall. It's tighter, it's closer. A lot of it's closer to that ADSPL that we had set, which is good. That's a good sign. And if we change this to uh, no smoothing, 
we can see a huge reduction in the change here. So I'm hovering over the new one and you can see the orange kind of overlaid behind it. I mean, that's a lot, that's a big difference. We got, we shaved off a lot of those spikes that I was hoping to shave off. Some of them are still here in the 600 range, which I find interesting. Um, but by and, by and large, we shaved off probably 80, 70, 80%, which is good. So let's pop over to our water vol waterfall view now and see the difference between these two. So here's the first one, no treatment. Uh, a lot of red uh, frequencies don't decay. We have a resonant frequency here and there and pretty much no purple to be seen. And we can hardly see any of this floor down at the bottom, meaning that the frequencies just are not decaying. Whereas with our new graph, with the acoustic treatment, we see less red, a lot, lot less red and orange, more blue. Um, and we have open floor down here, which means that it fully decayed during the test, which is great. Like I mentioned before, this thing, I knew it was going to be a uh, buildup of resonant frequencies. It's gonna be really hard to get rid of that. 50 hertz is pretty low. I'm gonna need, like I said, more bass traps. So if you guys have any questions or comments or you wanna talk about you know, your acoustic treatment process, leave that in the comments section below. I'd love to actually hear how many of you guys are actually acoustically treating your space. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys have a great day. I'll see you next time.